Okay, here we are. So hello everyone who's on and welcome to the 2023 Zero Waste Month kickoff. We're very excited to have you. My name is Hayden Sloan. I'm the Strategic Director of Communications for Race to Zero Waste. And we have a few people from our board, a few of our friends on today to talk about uh, what we're doing for Zero Waste Month, how we reduce waste, the kinds of things that we do. And we might give you some tips and tricks. We might show off a couple of things and hopefully you get excited about uh, Zero Waste Month here. So make sure that, uh, that you follow us in the chat, right? So we might have some polls and some questions that... Um, that could interest you and that will be really exciting. Um, so hopefully uh, you get inspired with some of the actions that our folks have to share with you today. We have a special guest, Katie Patrick, who will be joining us shortly and we will be excited to hear from her as well. She is great motivational and she is gonna share some of the things that she knows for Zero Waste Month. Um, so let's get started. So we have a we had a poll in the in the chat that says if you've participated in Zero Waste Month before. So most of you have, which is awesome. Welcome back. Uh, we hope that you'll try something new on your journey to zero waste uh, before you know before the month of October ends. So the whole of October is a. Uh, The whole of October is Zero Waste Month, so we hope that you will uh, take some inspiration. Let's go ahead and get started. So all of our folks who are on our call, um, come on in, bring up your cameras, say hi. So first we have, I see Linda Christopher is here up already, so why don't we have you say hi first? Hey, Linda. Hey there, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, come on through. Well, happy Zero Waste Month. I, uh, happy Zero Waste I Month. I don't feel very prepared, but I'm here and excited and ready to go. Great. What do you think you'll do this month? Or uh, what's, uh, what's a tip that you have for somebody who wants to participate in Zero Waste Month? Well, I think I want to renew my efforts for zero food waste. I had uh, really achieved that, and I feel like I'm slipping a bit. Mm. So I want to go back and revisit that. Because, you know, it's really just not new things. It's just the same thing all the time, but just getting better and better and better at it. And exactly. It yeah. And that's what Zero Waste Month is all about. We want to renew this motivation to like keep going with something that you were doing before or try it again. Um, maybe if someone else had tried composting and maybe it didn't really work, maybe try it again, see what you can do. Mm -hmm. But that zero food waste is a great, a great option. Um, and can you say your relationship to Race to Zero Waste as an organization? Oh, yes. Um, I'm on the board for Race to Zero Waste, and I've been working in recycling and zero waste for over 30 years. Awesome. Well, thanks, Linda. It's great to have you. And now I'm going to go to Daniela, who has her video on now, too. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Daniela. I'm the outreach coordinator with Race to Zero Waste. Um, and I will say my zero waste action that I've been really trying to do. I've been traveling a lot this summer and I've been researching um, basically composting or recycling programs in each country that I'm in. I'm in Latin America right now, I'm in Mexico. And uh, the building that I am staying in didn't have composting. So I researched an organization and got my uh, food scraps and other compostable material picked up um, so I could continue in my zero waste efforts. All right, so we've had two so far related to food waste. That's pretty good. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that, Daniela? How did you like? How did you find that? What kind of inspired you? How much work was it? Would other people be able to do it easily? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I googled. <laughs> it was a quick Google search of just like you know composting programs near me, near me, community gardens that maybe I could drop off my food scraps to. Um, anything like that. And I, I was, there was a couple organizations and there's also a couple organizations that pick up recycling because recycling is not really um, community-wide here in Mexico City. 
Um, so I was able to, you know, to drop off my glass and my plastic, certain types of plastics. Um, and, you know, kind of just like walking around the city too, seeing what they have. They have places where you can drop off certain types of plastics. They have little like kiosks where you can put your plastic bottles in and stuff like that. Um, and then of course, you know, making sure that I'm buying big jugs of water. So I'm not using, uh, like small water bottles and I'm, you know, I still have my reusable water bottle here. Um, so just trying my best to continue the efforts. Um, but I would say Google search, it's your best friend. Google's the great, great tool, great resource, <laughs> no matter where you are. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And so just that exploration is a really good way to, to start to kick off a zero waste month. Um, making sure, yeah, seeing if you can find something new or something related to zero waste in your town or in your city. If you looked last year and you didn't find something that you were looking for, maybe look again. Maybe someone's opened a refill shop. Maybe someone's started to implement some kind of comp local composting or, or community garden or something like that. And if you can't find it and you have the time and the capacity, it would be great if you started it. Um, and now we have. Katie Patrick. Hi, special guest Katie Patrick. Hi, hi. Sorry, I was late. My calendar um, link didn't come on, so I didn't get a like a, a, a notification, um, but I'm here. Luckily, I was, uh, Shereza found me. All right. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, and we're here for Zero Waste Month. And so uh, Katie Patrick has a special message for our subscribers and audience members here for Zero Waste Month. Maybe you can talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you're a special guest for Zero Waste Month. Uh, well, I'm an environmental engineer, and now I specialize in the behavioral psychology of how to get people to do pro-environmental action. So I do a really deep dive into the literature of like, what are the actual mechanisms that tap into people psychologically so we can actually build our campaigns our outreach our mechanisms of trying to persuade people that are really really going to work because I'm sure all of us have seen like or we've really really tried to convince people to do environmental stuff and it doesn't always stick um, but so there's a really quite wonderful um, and sort of prolific world of psychological research that um, that I study and then I have a slideshow that kind of explains the techniques of how to tap into the human human mind um, and I have a podcast on this also where I interview academic um, researchers about their, their studies in environmental psychology. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? Tell us about your podcast. Like, what are the things that could help our audience as they try to participate in Zero Waste Month? Um, well, I mean, I've got a, we can jump into my slideshow and I can sort of go through it all in a very like, um, sort of structured way, um, if you want. Uh, but <clears throat> I think the, the overall, um, way to, uh, to sort of sum it up all in a nutshell, there's kind of three big mistakes that people in sustainability tend to, to make. And unless somebody's pointed out at it for you you don't really know what they are and they are that if we increase knowledge people will do more green stuff if we get people to care more then they'll do it or if we can make it more financially viable but these three are shown by the behavioral research to actually be some of the weakest drivers to get people to do stuff um so if we actually look at the human brain there are five kind of access points to to really sort of get people um, motivated so one is like the dopamine system using goals and rewards um the and sort of tracking progress towards a goal um number two is social imitation like we tend to copy or just mimic other people if you see everybody doing zero waste actions you'll probably without even realizing it start copying those behaviors there's social comparison. If you rank like people in a leaderboard or communities and are you doing below average or above average? Uh, so people really don't want to be below average. Um, and then there's also trust, like making pledges or promises or commitments to an um, another person. And then there's like group identity. If you identify as like a zero waste person and you're part of a zero waste group, that group identity is very strong. So they're kind of like the five kind of big mechanisms. And so in the podcast, I look for um, studies that are going to provide really like useful insights into how to use these mechanisms in a campaign. So you'll actually like be able to see like a measurable change. Um, and yeah, and there's a journal called the Journal of Environmental Psychology. It publishes every two months it comes out, it publishes a whole host of research papers. 
uh, and they're really interesting and you kind of like explore them in great um, in great painstaking detail on the podcast. Wow, that sounds great. Well, if you want to get into your presentation, we would love to hear it. And then we will continue with some of our guests here on the call um, as we as we get uh, further into our kickoff. Okay, um, how long do I have? Because it can easily be quite long, this presentation. So I'm probably going to just talk really fast and flip through the slides quickly. Yeah, um, I would say 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Okay, okay. This is already hard to fit into 45 minutes. So I may just do a lot of like slide fast moving. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, now, where are we at? So I go to share screen. What am I doing here? Um, why is it? No, no, I'm not trying to share. What am I doing? I just go and Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. I haven't done a screen share for a little. I was trying to share my screen in the Chrome, not in the um, Zoom. Okay. Okay, so you can see my screen now. And now mm -hmm. I go into slideshow mode and it should be all black. Is yes. that cool? Yeah, okay, okay. Apologizing for my um, slide skipping and very fast talking, I'm trying to get it into the, to the time. Okay, so starting this um, whole uh, talk off, is this idea of a having a vision for sustainability. So my, I want you to take a moment to think about a memory when you were a child that probably got you, maybe not even a child, but some point in your life where you got pulled into your sustainability journey. Like there would be one moment where you were first and deeply hooked in. And for me, this was when I was in this little white Volkswagen, my mother's white Volkswagen in Melbourne in Australia. And I would look up at all of the city buildings in Melbourne and they were all sort of dirty and covered with soot and there was all this sort of like industry around. Um, and I just thought in my five-year-old mind that wouldn't it be amazing if it was covered in morning glories, if the world was just covered in plants and flowers. And I just could not understand why the grown-ups didn't, uh, like didn't do this. I was like, why is it? Why haven't they fixed this stuff up? But that mental image of being able to reimagine the world covered with plants and flowers and being clean and being beautiful, it never left me. And that was really the core of my journey in sustainability. And that's this core message that I want to impart is that we need to have a vision for the world uh, that we that we that we do want instead of always be fighting the thing um, that uh, we don't want. So I worked as an environmental engineer, um, imagining buildings were covered with trees. This was really crazy back then, twenty years ago. But now there are buildings um, covered with trees, and you know, having this kind of vision for this beautiful, sustainable, futuristic, eco-friendly world that is uh, deeply uh exciting and inspiring and you can see this building is covered with 2000 trees it exists it's in um it's in italy um and so we've probably heard a lot about like we hear this doom message all the time um so i really want to advocate in terms of to as an overarching message for everyone in sustainability is instead of this like shame fear doom what not to do that we have a message of what we are for it's very very different the message of this is where we want to go um, versus this is where um, this is where we don't want to go. So what we need is this beautiful, optimistic vision of the amazing future we are making. This might sound fun, but there's a lot of uh, neurological and sociological research about how this is uh, remarkably powerful in terms of tapping into people. And I love this quote. It's a famous quote by Antoine Saint-Exupéry where he says, if you want to build up build a ship, do not drum up the um, the men to gather the work, divide the work and give orders and said, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. So I ask everybody this question, what is the vast and endless sea that you want people to join you on? What is this amazing zero waste plastic free world? It's easy to talk about, oh, there's a big problem with plastic in the ocean, but how deeply is this world going to work in every single one of its functions? And that's a really beautiful thing to start illustrating to bring people um, into your into your into your campaigns and get them to really sign up for what it means to be zero waste, which is not an always an easy thing to do. 
So anyway, we have this really cool vision for what we want the planet to be, but how do we do it? So people like work on all sorts of stuff that doesn't even necessarily work. So we have to ask ourselves, are we doing anything that is truly measurable? Because this is what happens with environmental stuff. We think that education will drive change and we think that education will make people concerned. If you know about the polar bears, you care about the polar bears, but this does not necessarily lead to action. It is this thing called the value action gap, otherwise known as the information deficit hypothesis. And a lot of our environmental work falls down this value action gap. It is shown over and over again by behavioral science. And we can trick ourselves in thinking that our campaigns are working because lots of people saw them, but we really want to be tracking um, the action. And it really it starts to make sense when you look into the human brain. It kind of has these three layers. So we have the prefrontal cortex, which is evolutionary and more modern part of the brain. That's our intellectual part of the brain. And then we have the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain, and then the reptilian part of the brain, which is like um, our survival. And so we want to be tapping into these deeper brain structures, which is what the behavioral psychology does. If you're just using knowledge, you're only going to be not in the deeper drivers of the of the brain. So you mentioned before I have a book and I have um, a podcast on this. I also did actually write a zero waste book and had a zero waste YouTube channel. So um, I'm quite quite versed in the, the, the zero waste lifestyle. Now I mentioned earlier these five different um, levers to get into um, the brain: goals and rewards, social position, trust, um, and groups. So I'll jump first into goals and rewards because this is based around um, measurement. Uh, we want to trigger this thing called the dopamine reward circuit. You may have heard of the, the dopamine system before. It's made up of these three parts of the brain. There's the, um, the prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, which is in the limbic system, and then this deep part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And this system governs our quest for, uh, for warmth and food. This is triggered when we're falling in love, when we are addicted to cocaine. This is the system that drives human behavior. And if we're not tapping into the dopamine system, our environmental campaigns are not going to work. So I will um, show you how to do it. One of the first things that the dopamine system needs is just to like track progress towards a goal. So are you giving people a goal? Your goal is to cut plastic down by 50% or to, um, you know, get your compost for 30 days in a row. Like well, you need to have a very specific goal that people are signing up to and then you are tracking progress towards it. It might sound really simple, but um, it doesn't always happen and it's harder to do. Um, it sounds, it, it's harder to do in real life than it sounds. And even Bill Gates has this quote from his, um, annual letter talking about the um, the importance and the difficulty of just measuring exactly what you want to change and tracking it and making it um, happen. And what's really cool is that now that there's a whole lot of environmental sensors that we can use, I've built software for the University of Santa Cruz that gets um, the weighing scales. You can see this um, this uh, a truck here it actually weighs the amount of waste and then does it creates a, a gamified dashboard of um, how much waste the campus the campus creates. So we've got all of these sensors. We can find use all of these DIY ways of tracking uh, tracking waste and um, and pollution. But so cool. We can, so let's say we can get all the data right. Let's have a look into the research of like, well, how much does the data like does the data really affect people when they look at it? And the best example of this is something called the toxic release inventory. And this came out in the 1990s. The EPA wanted to understand how much toxic chemical use there was in, um, in the United States. And they asked all the American companies to disclose. And in a matter of years, toxic chemical use went down by 45%. That's huge. Think about what this could do for waste. If we had really good quality disclosure of data, of every waste everybody produced, businesses, households, uh, supermarkets, cities, and everybody was really looking at this data, we could see a huge, um, uh, uh, what we call uptick, downtick, a huge reduction in waste. It's you know, similar, similar to this. Uh, and think about it like a feedback loop. If you've ever been driven a Toyota Prius, you can really see the feedback loop of the emissions while you are driving on their dashboard. Um, 
and display. We see them in uh, these speeding signs. They reduce uh, car speed by 14%. But what's really cool about these feedback loops is they don't need to be high tech. You can use a handwritten sign that in this example, there was a handwritten sign in this study that showed the amount of paper that was recycled. Like if you just write it on a piece of paper and you stick it on the recycling bin, then the uh, the amount of paper that was recycled went up by 77%. Like that's totally bypassing the intellectual part of the brain, the emotional caring part of the brain that we have to pay people. It's just using a feedback loop of data naturally by itself just gets people to do the right thing. You can also use colored light. This is really interesting. Ambient messaging, um, how we can display environmental data with colors, not in the app or the computer, but sort of like out on screens on the wall. And um, research has shown that using just colored light alone to show the energy efficiency of buildings can actually reduce people's energy consumption by 12 to 56%. And this is crazy that people don't even know they're doing it. That's the power of colored light, just sitting there in the ambient um, ambient environment. Um, we could put our environmental data on billboards, like how much waste did Los Angeles or California make this month? Um, you know, air quality displays. Like we have all these ways of publicly signaling data that could be a really exciting way to kind of trigger this dopamine system. Um, this is a Chrome extension that I designed for the carbon emissions in the, the electricity grid. This could completely be um, applied to waste, to public waste data. Just applying colors, just applying data, um, <clears throat> and just showing the data that we have. It could be used in um, public art displays like this. Red means that it's a high emissions time of day. Green means it's a low um, emissions time of day. Um, and then we can look at like tracking progress. Like this might sound like ridiculously obvious, like we're, okay, we're like a progress bar. But let me tell you this, how many progress bars do you see for our environmental goals on any campaign anywhere? They're hardly ever there. So you want to have the start where we are right now to the end where we want to go, and then we're tracking progress in between. And everything I do starts off with this model, and I designed a... Sorry, my dog is making all this noise. Stop it. Come back to Um, And this was the overarching principle of the game design. Um, it's got more pictures of it in, in my book. Um, but it's like how much waste do we actually make? Where do we want to go? We want to get to zero. And then as you make it through the game, it gives you you progress bar tracks towards um, zero. This is one I did for the United Nations, just basically laying out if they wanna, they wanna restore 10 billion hectares of the planet, let's just put it on a progress bar and track our progress to getting there. Because we've all seen a lot of um, ambitious environmental targets and then 10 years goes by and we don't really see that much progress made on them. Um, I don't know why my dog is doing this. Come here, come here, come here right now. Okay. Um, this is a dashboard for cities. It's done for CO2, but you could apply exactly the same thing for waste. Again, tracking progress towards a goal. Um, and we really want to trigger this reward center of the brain. The brain wants a cookie. It wants a smiley face. It wants someone to say, good job. Um, we can add all these things in to reward people after they have made um, the action. And in this one study, a friend of mine did with Wikipedia editors, she just gave people a thing that said thank you and a little white flower badge. And it got people's uh, commitment to, or the time they spent editing Wikipedia to go up by 20% just by this tiny intervention. These little things can be added and they, they truly, truly work and they're not that hard uh, to do. You can divide it into levels. Zero waste living, you know, as an independent consumer person, we all know it's really hard to do. Uh, and we can move out of this binary. Are you like fully zero waste or are you fully vegan? Um, and just put it into levels. This really works. You're at level one, two, three, four. You start easy and then you progress to hard. This is something I would love to see done more in, um, in these, um, these programs. And so we can start to see it kind of like a Fitbit. It gathers the data, 
um, we give people rewards and we call it, I call this type of design like Fitbit for the, um, Fitbit for uh, the planet. Um, you can find different ways of adding novelty. This is one of the augmented reality um, design I did. If we could see air pollution, like the sensors on the street, we could emotionally more connect with that air pollution to drive action. Do the same thing with the carbon emissions or the electricity consumption of buildings to um, drive energy efficiency in buildings with uh, thermal photography. This would be the temperature of surfaces with imagining, you know, the sustainable future world. Could we actually see this layer using uh, augmented reality glasses and, you know, inspire people with this vision for what we do want rather than like what we don't want. And this was actually done in Germany. They, um, <clears throat> Some guys, this is, I've got a podcast episode with interview with the guys who made this, where you can actually hold up a iPad or a, um, or a phone and it will see um, a reimagining, like a biophilic eco-friendly reimagining of the, of the city street using their app. So we could get in contact with them and do this anywhere, um, you know, hold something up, have a look at it. Um, and it's really fun. You can also, people can even make their own worlds. Like you can see there's a, um, there's a penguin, a rhinoceros, a zebra over here. Um, and by people creatively engaging with the visualization, um, they get more deeply invested and this trickles through into their, um, into their behavior. Okay, another one I said is social position. The human brain like really cares a lot about how it compares to um, other people. So you might've seen these charts in your electricity bill they compare you to others and give you a smiley face this stuff really works gets a three percent reduction in energy consumption across the board it may not sound like much but when you think about it across thousands hundreds of thousands of people or millions it is really actually quite quite a bit you can give star ratings and then rank everybody can we rank um you can rank cities rank businesses give them star ratings add color the car safety ratings has caused a 22% reduction in car deaths since it was um, since it was brought in. We have the energy efficiency stickers on appliances. This is the government requiring that the data be made public, and then we add this leaderboards, star ratings, and colors on top of it to encourage um, sort of the industry and people to take uh, take the action. We can also do this with blocks of houses. If you can get groups of people together, another um, uh, study. Uh, one of the women I interviewed on my podcast, she mentioned in one of the introductions of her study, another study that was done that said 26 recent studies shows that the block leader approach was the best way to encourage community conservation and eco-friendly action above all. So 26 recent studies showed that getting Groups of neighbors together works better than anything else. So you can get groups of neighbors together and then you can rank them, give them a score, give them a goal and get them to work together kind of like teams in a, um, like teams in a, in, a, in a football game. This is the ideal model, I believe, to approach uh, environmental change. Small active community groups of just 10 people, maybe 20 people each, lots of groups, getting them to all sort of work together to reach um, to reach the goal. And I added this also to the Energy Lollipop app. You see how this, I put a line around it, how you compare to other people. All the user testing I've done is people go straight into this and they're like, how do I compare? Am I better? Am I worse? Why? Why? You can really see people go straight into that um, that social comparison. It would be really interesting to see this applied to waste if there were a good mechanism to um, to measure people's amount of waste, it would have to be done through the garbage trucks. Not an easy thing to do, but not impossible. Um, and I have done it once with garbage trucks, but all the garbage trucks have to be fitted out with scales to get the data. And that's no um, that's no small feat to, to be done. And then you can use like, you know, cute little animals and stuff to reward people. Um, and if we can get scores for everybody's neighborhood, like imagine if we could have a score, like a waste score for every single neighborhood. This is San Francisco. Uh, and then, you know, we could see how everybody was doing. Like that could really impact people and really filter through to their behaviors. So they could be the winning um, neighborhood. This is another data set of urban heat islands, the surface temperature of Los Angeles. It's adding the same thing. Can we get a score per house and can we compare people? 
that's the real sort of secret source of this idea. And then you can tell people how they're doing and how they compare to, to the average and give your know, prizes for the coolest uh, company, the hottest company. Once you've got all that data, you can really sort of go to town with it and have some have some fun. A uh, leaderboard for um, apartments um, in a building, that's that idea. Um, and then this uh, section, um, imitation number three. Wait, I might just check the chat, see if um like the funding thermometer. Okay, cool. Um, Okay, so one thing I think that really is a big deal for zero waste is that people copy each other's behaviours. When you're using your reusable mug or your reusable bag or um, you have post a picture on Instagram with all of your um, cotton bags, you know, with all of the stuff in it, all plastic-free, that stuff really works. People copy. People only really do behaviours by copying other people. There is no other way how to learn how to do a behaviour. So this one study um, tested this out with a group of um, men in a communal shower at, at a college, and they had a sign up that says, "Please help save the water and turn the shower turn off the shower while I'm soaping up." And nobody did it. Nobody turned the shower off while they were putting soap on themselves. So they hired this actor, and then all of a sudden, forty nine percent. So half of the people, by having one person do the the actual action. 50, almost 50% of all the other men copied. And then they put in a second actor and it jumped to 67%. So if you seed people in a company or in a group or in a campus to do the zero waste behavior, people will copy them. That is how humans, humans behave. You don't need to worry about complicated education and documentaries and reading books. Just get people to copy each other. Put a picture on the wall of the action that you want um, that you want people to do. This is called social um, social norms because we just we are copying each other all of the time. We can't even help it. We are so programmed to copy each other. There's there's just no other way um, to be. And you can see this on solar panels, satellite views of solar panels. There are all of these clusters where um, you see like this one here, if you see what, if you look at solar panels, you'll see like five houses all right next to each other will have solar because one person got it and then the neighbours saw them and then more neighbours saw them. And you can apply the same basic gamification structure to something like this, like looking at the houses, having a progress bar of where we want to go, having these kind of open badges that aren't filled yet. And then they get a uh, sun when they get the solar on, and then you can rank them all and sort of track their track their progress. It's just really sort of basic stuff that's really um, sort of powerful and elaborate ways of what I said before, tracking progress um, towards a uh, goal. <coughs> and you can use badges, using maps. Um, these are some badges I made for houses. Can you put like a badge at this at the front? Um, I suppose these are made of plastic, so that might be a bit tricky with the whole zero waste thing, but you could find a, um, another way to, to make them, you know, saying like we're taking on the zero waste challenge or we did 30 days zero waste or some ways of like publicly signaling to their neighbours that they are engaged in, um, in the action. And this one about trust is really interesting. So I see I've got a zero waste pledge here. I just did a little video about this that I posted on my Instagram if you want to um, uh, check it out. And it's a, the latest episode on my podcast is just, you may have seen this before, just get people to pledge. Write down, what is your commitment? I pledge to make my own plastic free lunch. Um, ask a group of people to we'll figure out what their plastic free zero waste pledge is, get them to write it down. And I promise you they will stick to it because I've done it before and it is remarkably psychologically sticky. This is one I did for a zero waste meetup. And all these people were like, they were sending me pictures. This guy, I um, maybe he's still here. I saw him at the um, one of the other zero waste events. He's like, Katie, I'm still one year later making my own toothpaste. Like a couple of years before this, I thought making your own toothpaste was the craziest thing ever. And then I looked it up on YouTube and I realized people did it. Um, but just like this writing it down, photographing the selfie, making it public, this is so powerful and it is so easy like there's we should all be doing this um okay and then you want to when you get people into groups and they're all doing it um 
together. And that's what social media can be great about sending messages to groups. You can use um, these little filters using Facebook Spark AR. This is some exciting ones that were done by a company um, in Singapore. The um, <laughs> I don't quite know how you would apply this to zero waste, but it's a really fun example. Um, they got this eye cat, this mechanical cat, to either smile or frown at you, depending on how energy efficient you were. And then people's um, energy consumption went down by 47, 47%. Um, just by having this emotional impact of the smiling or the frowning of the cat. So you can extrapolate that out to like a group or there are people doing it. This smiling or the frowning or the judgment of others is very, very powerful. And it can just be done with like a face like that. Um, they also did this on the this thing called the environmental dashboard at Oberlin where they have flashed the energy squirrel, which smiles um, or frowns uh, depending on the energy consumption of the entire school could also be something that could be applied to waste data if it's being measured. Um, and they actually tested the kids and they found that the kids in the schools in Oberlin, Ohio, actually felt happy or sad depending on flash, whether the flash the energy squirrel was happy or sad, um, reflecting this way of like really getting people to connect with the data in a much more emotionally deep way. Um, so that's a very fast talking snapshot of this type of um, this type of design that you can use. And I think with all of these tools, honestly, all of us in sustainability, we are only at like a three out of 10 of our potential. I think if we put all this stuff in, we could just rise up to being just incredibly influential change makers. And we could see these tipping points of change that we also desperately want to see happen. Like if we do this stuff, it really, really works. And I think we've been a little bit like, the blind leading the blind and how we're trying to psychologically influence people because we haven't really known this stuff before. It hasn't really gotten out there. And once you know how to do it, it really is like a key in the lock of the human mind. Um, and it works. You still have to put in the work to make your campaign and to get it out to people. But it means that when you do get out to those people, like it'll, it can just fall like dominoes instead of sort of getting like, no, 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 and it feeling really, really hard. Um, the brain is a machine and we can learn how, um, how it works. And just to finish off, um, to wrap it back into this idea of like imagining the positive future, we, um, the exercise, the activity of imagining the future world, this one study showed that actively drawing a picture of the um of the ecological future actually increased people's pro-environmental behavior and their how funny is this the garbage truck is like right next to my window right now being very loud i hate it i hate this garbage truck. um uh yeah so this study was done and then they tested people and their actual environmental behaviors and their political activity actually went up and I found that myself in hosting these workshops um, I host these environmental imagination workshops where I get um, both adults and children to kind of draw the eco-friendly future and it has the most remarkable psychological effect on on people it may not be directly teaching zero waste but if you can get any group of people to do this creative activity it really, really does trickle down into their behaviours. And it may possibly be one of um, the most powerful transformations that people experience when they're um, to try to actually get them to do the behaviours because it's hard to do this stuff. Um, and we need some kind of deep transformation. This is some of the stuff that the kids the kids did. This is Sorry, this is one that a, that a child did. An eight-year-old girl just did this beautiful illustration of, you know, eco-future future worlds. And I have a lot more on my Instagram if you want to have a look at that as well. Um, and, you know, just doing this simple before and after, take a photo of something looks bad, ugly, cover it with trees. This is my daughter outside our very barren local ice cream shop, cover it with flowers. Um, and it's just very deeply moving for people to uh to do this i kind of feel like this is a a treasure trove of environmental behavior design that's been um undiscovered so that's the end inspirational quote to end on it's the practical dreamers that have always been and will always be the pattern makers of civilization 
So always remember to keep your imagination out there in the positive future that we want to build and then use all the behavior techniques to reverse engineer back and get every people get everybody on board um, that way. So I hope I talked fast enough. Um, <laughs> it was, that was it wonderful, sure. Katie. Thank <laughs> you. Um, that picture that one of the kids drew of that like purple kind of tower garden looks like a park in Singapore. I think That's it was inspired cool. by that. Yeah, yeah. I think the girl was inspired by that, seeing pictures of that. That's a great idea to envision what we want to see. Um, and I think one of my big takeaways is uh, copying behaviors. And so one of the things that we do for this campaign is that any action that you're taking, even if it seems really simple, even if it seems like, oh, everyone's doing it, like, there's someone who's not because we saw like, you know, with that, you know, turn off the water while you're taking a shower example, it was up by 67%, but there's still a few people who weren't doing it. So keep sharing those actions. And that's what Zero Waste Month, this social campaign is all about, that you share even your simplest zero waste actions. And so as part of that, so I'm going to take my little time to talk here and we're going to take a little trip. Um, Katie, do you want to yeah, stop sharing your screen? Sharing. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, we're going to take a little trip to my bathroom so I can show you a couple of the things that I'm doing to reduce waste. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I'm going to share right now. And then we'll have um, Nancy from our board. She's from Bay, Bay Area Bin Support. Maybe she can share a little something. Hi, Nancy. Hello. Hi, Hi everybody. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Yes, I would be happy to share. Great. All right. So I'm going to just turn off my virtual background really quick so we can see this. All right. So I have a couple of things that I've laid out on my sink here just to kind of share with everybody what we have going on. And so let me set up right here. Welcome to my bathroom. It's a little weird, but zero waste in the bathroom is a great place to start. And so I just wanted to share a couple of things that I've done. Uh, one is recycled content toilet paper. It's already kind of brown, might seem a little weird, but it's recycled content. We're reducing the amount of water that we need to use, we're reducing the amount of virgin paper that we need to use. And so that's reducing waste. Don't use a lot, obviously. Um, the next thing I have is my menstrual cup here. So I use this when I'm on my period. It's a great way to reduce waste for those who are able to use it. Um, or reusable pads. I have those too, but I didn't bring them out to show that I use sometimes as well when I don't feel like putting in my menstrual cup. Um, the other thing I have, I thought this was really cool. This is a recycled content um, toothbrush. And so, um, and it has this little pop-out bristle that you can pop out. Sorry, it's covered in toothpaste. I do brush my teeth. <laughs> Um, so you pop out this bristle and it comes with like little changes. And so instead of having to throw away like this whole plastic part, when you're done with your toothbrush, and it's time to replace it. You just replace the little head. And that's pretty cool. I thought that was really neat. And so that's one toothbrush that I have. Next thing is some sunscreen. I'm very white, so I have to wear sunscreen a lot and I'm a scuba diver. So it's really important to have reef safe sunscreen. That's not going to hurt the reefs or the little fishes or the little aquatic organisms that are in there. And so this is one of those as well. And it's uh, raw elements, SPF 30, works fine, makes you a little whiter than you already are, but it's good. And then I also have some re-up floss. So I got some little wooden like zero waste floss here. That's pretty cool. Um, if your teeth are really close together, it's kind of hard to use like mine are here at the bottom, but, uh, but we, we make it work, right? Because we're trying to reduce waste. And then I will show a couple of the plastic tubes that I have. I know it's plastic. We want to try to avoid plastic, but I have not found locally a toothpaste that works for me yet. And so I try to get a decent toothpaste that like saves water. The tube can be recycled here where I live. Maybe it can't be recycled where you live. Um, and then this gel is uh, something that my mom gifted me because she wasn't going to use it. And so instead of throwing it away, well, all right, I'll use it because I like to put gel on my curls sometimes. And at least that's a product that's not being wasted. So zero waste, right? 
Okay, and that's my little bathroom tour, super quick. Obviously, I use a towel to dry my hands, not paper towels. Um, I think that's pretty common in house bathrooms anyway. But yeah, tell me what you think. Anybody? That's awesome. Um, tell me more about that brand of floss. Yeah, it's uh, it's from ReUp. They have actually been a sponsor of ours before or have worked with us on promotional partnering for mm -hmm. uh, another event that we have, but ReUp Refill. And so then once that little like box is done, uh, you can get refills for it as well and just pop the little circle of floss in. Can the floss be composted? That's a good question. I'm not sure if it can be composted. I haven't looked. Um, mm -hmm. I have just been throwing it away. And if it can be composted, well, that's another way to reduce waste. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Um, what are some, so we talked about, uh, you know, composting, reducing food waste. Um, Nancy, why don't you come on and tell us what you're doing for Zero Waste Month and what's your relationship to Race to Zero Waste? Hi, everybody. I am Nancy Fiamme from Bay Area Bin Support. Our company, what we do, our relation to zero waste is so we actually provide waste maintenance, uh, waste solutions, waste management services to multifamily and commercial properties. So we manage um, the waste programs for hundreds of buildings across the Bay Area and in that really try to help them reach zero waste goals to recycle, to compost, to really be the eyes and ears on the property to let the property managers know, hey, you know, you can send these reminders to your tenants. Um, and we do sorting and um, and uh, decontamination of the bins. And so it's something that we really want to we, we try to promote from within, but as well as um, to our client base. And so what I, one of the zero waste actions that I take every single day, so I have my reusable lunch bag that I bring to work every single day. And inside I have my reusable water bottle. And I also, instead of grabbing um, I grab my utensils from home. So um, instead of using plastic utensils for my lunch, I always bring them from home and then take them back home and wash them. And another thing that I always do is I always pick, um, so I stopped buying, so I love my Diet Coke. I have a Diet Coke every single day in the afternoon. However, I don't um, buy bottles anymore. So I know that aluminum can be recycled indefinitely. And so I tell anybody who will listen, if you have the choice between picking a bottle or a can, please grab the can instead. Um, and so our, our kitchen inside is stocked with cans um, for our guys and our team anytime that they want to, um, to grab a drink. And so those are just some of my daily zero waste actions. Um, that I do. And I don't even think about it anymore. Like, it's just so natural. It's just, um, I, I can't even picture myself hold, I cringe when I see plastic water bottles. I don't understand. Um, reusable bottles are so readily available everywhere. And so, um, yeah, and it's just some, all my kids. That, and, and one of the things I just have to say is that it makes me really happy because I see the difference when I was growing up um, to now I go to my kids school and I see all the kids with their reusable water bottles. Like everybody just naturally carries them around. Like it's just a part of the routine and that makes me very happy. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how we do, how I'm doing my part. And I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Nancy. That was a, those are great, uh, zero waste swaps. And yeah, like if you can't completely cut something out of your life, like we're not asking you to, you know, live like a monk, I guess, uh, you know, we're asking you to make these swaps and making the swap from the bottle to the can is a great way to do it. Um, and I had a question about, uh, the toothbrush. Uh, I don't know what brand it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> It came, the question came up in the chat. Um, I bought it at Carrefour, uh, which is a grocery store that's over here uh, near where I live. And so 
I have no idea because I don't have the box anymore. Um, but it was a really cool find. I don't know if I could still find it. Sometimes products like come and go, but it's always just keeping an eye out for what's local to you. So a lot of the things like the toothpaste option, for example, um, I just haven't found one local that I like. And I did do coconut oil like mix for a little while, but I ended up with um, some damage to one of my teeth. And so my dentist told me that I should use toothpaste, like tube of toothpaste, and I don't want to lose my teeth yet. So, um, so I'm trying to do, you know, what's right for my body and also what's right for the planet, which is, you know, kind of a balance sometimes. Can I share a um, little known, possibly completely unknown zero waste hack? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, when I first started getting into zero waste like 10 years ago, I realized that you could make your own, um, like all the things, like make your own makeup, toothpaste. Like, and I was like, wow, like I just it never crossed my mind to look at the ingredients of something that was like a personal care product. So I started doing that. And then I looked into uh, these um, uh, these really expensive skincare products had this one compound called um, hyd hydraulic what's it called I've got it here Hy hyaluronic um, uh -huh. hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic yeah. acid. all these like expensive serums I looked it up I buy it this thing here I got it my zoom background is making it go okay so this tiny little thing here I bought this more than three years ago maybe four I got this before COVID like it maybe it was four years ago um I don't know if you can see how much is left. I've been using this every single day on my skin. I get the tiniest little bit. It's really strong, like the tiniest little bit on the end of my finger like that. And then you just dot it around your face, mix it with some water, um, and it totally, like, hydrates your skin. It's really amazing. I feel like really my skin feels really dry if I don't use it because I'm so used to using it now. And I have not bought any skincare products in four years beyond this and I've only used like three quarters of it it just goes so far um so yeah. this is my ultimate skincare tip not having to get all these expensive bottles of stuff and using them there you go so everybody can copy that <laughs> Um, yeah, that sounds great. I think finding those things that last for a really long time is an excellent solution to reducing waste. So hopefully uh, other folks in our audience can take the, this inspiration and go from there. And we are just about at the end of our hour. This has been incredible. Thank you so much for your presentation, Katie. Thanks to everyone who joined us from our board members to Race to Zero Waste staff and from the audience in the chat on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Um, and follow us at Race to Zero Waste. We're on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, or I guess X. And, uh, and we hope to see your actions for zero waste month, use the hashtag, share what you're doing. Um, you know, if three people see it, then that's three people who can possibly change their habits. So let's do it. Let's make this world a better place. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, good luck, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Join us on October 5th for the Global Plastics Treaty discussion. We'll see you then.